I remember the prospect of showing up in history books not by doing something historic, but just by voting. The back of my middle school American history textbook listed the exact number of popular votes for each major candidate. And my young heart thrilled at thinking that I, when I was old enough to vote, could change those historic outcomes by one. You see, my young imagination wasn't formed by the church, but primarily by my own country. Philadelphia's Independence Hall was the closest I knew to a holy site because it was where I perceived the most reverence from my teachers. So being counted in an American election was almost metaphysically exciting to me, but not so much anymore. In fact, I even gave up my chance to change future history textbooks by one because I didn't vote for either major candidate. But it doesn't bother me that I won't appear in those books because I and you, no matter who you voted or didn't vote for, show up in this book this morning. I don't ask for these only, says Jesus to the Father, referring to his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. He is referring to me and to you if you believe. (laughs) We get a shout out by Jesus in the text today. We show up in this book. That kind of election, that choice for us is something worth getting metaphysically excited about. There was some big buildup to the moment we have here. Jesus speaks of the sheep, not of this fold in chapter 10. That's us. The children of God who are scattered abroad in chapter 11, us again. But in chapter 17, we're very clearly singled out. Did your parents ever make one of those personalized children's books for you? You know, it's got a hole in it. And you put your kid's photo in the back so they can see themselves on every page. I am not that good of a parent, so I just photoshopped my kids into this book (laughs) for the purposes of illustrating for you what the Gospel of John is like. It has a hole in it. We're supposed to see ourselves in every page. (laughs) I think that's why the anonymous beloved disciple isn't named. It's supposed to be you and me lying on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, speaking intimately with him as others look on. But that was chapter 13. Now we show up again in 17 as part of Professor Jesus' last lecture, and it's about glory. The glory of this country, 240 years old. But the glory that Jesus offers us here is ageless before the foundation of the world, before hydrogen, before helium, there was GL. (laughs) I didn't give it an atomic number because it's not part of this universe, though such glory did cause this universe to be. John 17's message of glory is the last thing Jesus says before he gets arrested in the following verses. So we could call it his last will and testament. His parting wish is very simple. Our unity is his dying request, which we have proven incapable of granting him. We're not united. We have found a way of being church, explains Peter Lightheart, that lets us be at peace with division. It's the American way. It's called denominationalism. Christianized babble, as he puts it. And we're just fine with it because, you know, it's our identity, our market share. And I know there are famous workarounds, right? The Calvinists or the Pentecostals' spiritual unity. But Jesus says we're to be unified so that the world will know. So how can it just be spiritual? An invisible unity is not a biblical unity, continues Peter Lightheart. Of course, there's another workaround, namely the suggestion that unity subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. Those one billion Catholic Christians, some worshiping with us here this morning, claim to be fully unified. But of course, the greatest challenge to that is the 300 million 
Orthodox Christians, some also worshiping with us this morning, who make a very similar claim to be the entirety of Christ's body. And they can't both be right. As Wheaton grad and Reformation historian Ron Richters puts it, these competing Orthodox and Catholic claims are like an impossible choice between two mothers. I think the truth is Jesus lets us listen in on his dying plea to his father that we would be one, and we said, no. There's a very simple consequence to that refusal. Jesus pleads for our unity so that the world may know, and we split so the world doesn't. It's a pretty straightforward reading of this morning's text. We divide, the world derides. One of the great things about art galleries is they often offer concentrated expressions of the world that John is talking about. And because of this, if I'm honest, exposing the vacuity of parts of the contemporary art world can help me feel really good about myself as a Christian. The Turner Prize, a major art award in Britain, can always be counted for help in this regard. And this year, one of the entries was a giant rear end under which you could walk to enter the gallery. I wanted to show you the image, but this is chapel, and frankly, it wasn't appropriate. This is as close... <laughs> Close as I was willing to get. Okay, my censorship, no one else's. I, I self-censored here. <laughs> so I read about this, and just as I was about to mount my Christian high horse, I was like on the stirrups, from which I would deride the silly art world, I opened up Carlos Ayer's massive study published in conjunction with this 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And I found something a lot worse. It is a print made by Protestants, evangelical art, we could say. I wanted to show you the image, but this is chapel, and frankly, it wasn't appropriate. This is as close as I was willing to get. Here is how Ayer describes this image. It links scatology and eschatology, all for the sake of simple folk. This, one of the most obscenely outrageous of all Reformation images, the very epitome of smear tactics, reduces the work of Johann Cochleus, a Catholic who attacked Martin Luther, to fecal matter. In this image, the devil defecated into Cochleus' mouth, and Cochleus in turn excretes books out of his rear end. As devils gleefully dance in celebration of this process, a monk and a prince pick up the books, bringing the Reformation to the lowest possible level. End quote. Now, Ayer admits Luther was not responsible for all that was printed or even a fraction of it, but he was inextricably connected to it and he benefited from it. Now, of course, Catholics could be just as severe in their caricatures of Protestants. And what this means is if I want relief from the way we Christians have treated one another, I might tune into, I don't know, political bickering on CNN in 2017 which I can rely on to be cleaner. Or I could retreat into a more mildly obscene Turner Prize exhibition in London for relief. And I hope that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Gregory of Nazianzus, the great early church father, said that Christ's death was intended to become to all what churning is to milk drawing us together and compressing us into unity. But our problem is we've not been churned enough. We're quite satisfied with our confessional clumps. Maybe some of us were churned this year as we read Shusako Endo's novel, Silence. Film was overlooked at the Oscars last night, but we will be screening it right here on the Tuesday after spring break. As you know, in their attempt to eradicate Christianity, Japanese authorities designed new forms of torture that would make Nero blush. They were very good at it. And we read the novel and agonize about God's silence in this affair, and I suppose that's a good thing to wrestle with, but I wonder if the message is far more straightforward. Because you want to know why the church was being eradicated in Japan? <laughs> 
Read page 14 of the introduction. We learn that it was the Protestant Englishman, Will Adams, quote, who lost no time in assuring the shogun that many European monarchs distrusted these meddlesome Jesuit priests and expelled them from their kingdom. It was our suggestion. So yes, it's a fine idea for a Protestant school to launch our new curriculum with this novel because we Protestants help create the hellscape that Endo so movingly depicts. Torture of Japanese peasants brought to you by inter-Christian discord. We divide, the world derides. The Jesuits, as you know, were in this part of the world as well, spreading the gospel amongst the Native Americans, many of whom received the gospel for themselves. But one of the reasons the gospel was hindered among them is because of our disunity. A U.S. official once asked the famous Nez Perce Indian Chief Joseph why he had banned missionaries from his reservation. And his response was, because the missionaries will teach us to quarrel about God as Catholics and Protestants do. We do not want to learn that. We must quarrel with men sometimes about things on earth, but we never quarrel about the great spirit. We do not want to learn that. I'm not saying theology doesn't matter. It does, but it's hard to hear Chief Joseph's lament and not think of the wisdom of Jesus in John 17. We divide, the world derides. There are some people, though, filled with the spirit whom the Father is using to grant Jesus his request. I'm speaking about a Catholic theologian named Matthew Levering, who frequently invites Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant thinkers together to the nearby Mundelein Seminary where he teaches. He invites Wheaton professors too. Now we need to be there maybe as an act of atonement for scatological prints. And at one of these events, we read through Thomas Aquinas' richly Pauline, almost Lutheran account of grace in the Summa. Our guide was the famous University of Chicago medievalist, Professor Bernard McGinn. Quite a guide for that tour. It's the kind of gathering that's the nightmare of many Protestants. Being surrounded by really smart Catholic thinkers, Dominicans, Benedictines, who might want to convert you. <laughs> But the overlap with Protestant understandings of grace in Aquinas was dramatic. In fact, at one point, Professor McGinn slammed his hand on the table with the original Latin of question 114 in front of him and shouted, citing Thomas, Solus Christus. That's one of the Reformation bumper stickers. <laughs> Christ alone. And you might hear that story and conclude, as some former Wheaton evangelical students have done, and even some former evangelical Wheaton professors have done, that, well, we should then become Catholic. Go home to Rome. But let me tell you what happened next. We Protestants humbly asked Professor McGinn, where was this in the 16th century? And he answered very straightforwardly, it had been lost. Semi-Pelagianism, the idea that we could work to God partially with our own strength, McGinn told us, was the norm. And my read of the 16th century would be that had Martin Luther not recovered it 500 years ago for the sake of the whole church, the treasure of God's radical grace might have stayed buried. And the reason I say that isn't because I'm an expert in the 16th century, but because it's the story of my own life and maybe the story of yours. I had a troubled soul as a young boy, agonizing, and I mean agonizing, about the idea of eternity. My mother took me to our Catholic parish priest, but no assurance was offered. The gospel of God's free grace was as buried in that New Jersey parish as it was in 16th century Europe. But the message of God's pure, unmerited favor bubbled up cold and clear through the plain gospel preaching of a local evangelical youth group. And it changed my life. And it brought me to Wheaton as an undergrad. And I might want to leave my narrative there. It's a trustworthy narrative if it ends at Wheaton College. 
But the truth is, over a decade later, back in New Jersey for graduate school, I was surrounded by a Protestantism that to me was just as much of a desert. More interested in identity politics than in grace. Not solus Christus, but as David Wells once quipped, sola cultura. Culture alone is the bumper sticker for many mainline Protestants. And in this desert, grace bubbled up again for me, cold and clear, through beloved Roman Catholic and Orthodox friends. <laughs> and in one of the Catholic devotional guides that my friends gave me, I found the same message of unmerited grace that I had encountered in youth group. Jacques Philippe read like Martin Luther, when you no longer believe in what you can do for God, continue to believe in what God can do for you. <laughs> that is the gospel. It reminded me of the time I wept in an Orthodox monastery bookstore in Medioia, Greece, because I read that same message of grace in John Chrysostom's 76th homily on Matthew. Be in need of nothing, says Jesus. I am all. Only cling closely. I was poor for you, a wanderer for you, on the cross for you, in the tomb for you. And it reminded me of my sojourn and an all-black Pentecostal church in Camden, New Jersey that welcomed me in. And the atmosphere there was so dense with adoration that you felt like you were swimming in grace. I saw real miracles happen there. But the biggest of them all was the grace they showed to an unexpected visitor like me. Evangelical Protestants don't own grace. It cannot be branded, but it does need to be rediscovered now because it's the only thing that can save us from the mess that much of the Reformation has become. So we should rejoice wherever we find it. <laughs> As our statement of faith here at Wheaton puts it, we believe, I love the capital letters, like we really do, we, we believe and we do that the one holy universal church is the body of Christ and is composed of the communities of Christ's people. There is breadth there. <laughs> we don't claim to be the whole. Ritger suggests that for this reason, perhaps the larger goal of 2017 should be prepare the way for 2054 when Christians will observe the millennial anniversary of the tragic unnecessary schism between Catholics and the Orthodox. And the one thing that will bring our fragmented churches together, whether in 2017 or in 2054, is grace, capital letters. <laughs> Certainly one attractive feature of the Protestant tradition is that we are the ones who look most ridiculous without it. It is all we've got, it is all we need, and it is all we have to give. And given it, we have. My first semester teaching at Wheaton, I had a 60-person art survey class, which some of you have taken, two credits, one quad. Students have to pick an image from art history that defines their aspiration, their relationship with God in some way, and one of my students named Ramey Harris kept sending me emails, dialoguing with me about what image she was going to choose. And I was a young professor then, so I actually replied to the emails. <laughs> I sent her suggestions. She said she was thinking about one day becoming a mother, so I commended Angelica Kaufman to her, where Cornelia shows off her children as the real treasures in comparison to the mere bling of her companion. Ramey didn't go for this image. She said she was contemplating marriage, so I suggested Rembrandt's painting of a Mennonite couple to her. In fact, one of the best marriage paintings ever made. I love this one, as so many of you know, because the wife is clearly more fascinated with the word of God than with her husband. <laughs> but Ramey didn't choose it. I was giving her the gold. All right. She didn't even want an image about incredible things she might one day do for God either. She was intrigued instead by an image that many of you will have seen hanging in Chaplain Blackman's office, Rembrandt's return of the prodigal son. I had mentioned it in class. I commended Henry Nouwen's book on the painting. 
And she liked the painting so much she even asked to borrow my copy of Nowen's book over Thanksgiving break. I actually lent it to her. I was young. <laughs> now, Henry Nowen, of course, is Father Henry Nowen, a Catholic priest. But let me read to you a passage from the book I lent to Ramey. Nowen says, quote, I am totally unable to root out my own resentments. They are so deeply anchored in the soil of my inner self that pulling them out feels like self-destruction. Confronted here with the impossibility of self-redemption, I now understand Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Do not be surprised when I say, you must be born from above. Indeed, something has to happen that I myself cannot cause to happen. I cannot be reborn from below. That is from my own strength, my own mind, my own insights, end quote. Homework assignment. Best kind, you won't be graded for it. I'll collect nothing, okay? Read Martin Luther's 1525 debate with Erasmus on free will and ask yourself, where does Nowen, the Catholic priest, land? with the prince of the humanists or with Luther's notion of the bondage of the will. Nowens is as clear an articulation of the Protestant understanding of grace that I can conceive. I think the best Catholic spiritual directors know Luther was on to something about the dynamics of the human heart and the Protestant painter Rembrandt could paint those same dynamics. And so were they transmitted to Nowens. Acknowledging our self-imposed bondage, we collapse into his arms and the whole Christian life start to finish. From the 100 level class to the graduate seminar is about learning to stay there and need nothing else. Not even to need to please him, let alone please other people. Now and says his immense red cape is like the wings of a mother bird covering her fragile nestling. And I like to imagine that Ramey was reading that passage when the plane her earthly father was flying showed its first signs of failure. I imagine she was reading the line, he won't ask any questions about my past, just having me back is all he desires as her plane went down, flying back from Thanksgiving break. When I got the email that she, her sister, her father, and a friend had died in that plane crash, I remember a really weird feeling walking into this chapel. Why are we going about our business? A 21-year-old student just died. But I then learned that part of my business was to take that email chain and share it with Ramey's mother who had just lost two daughters and her husband and show her that her daughter had not chosen an image of her prospect of having a husband or children. She had not chosen an image about what she would do for God. Instead, she had chosen an image about resting in God's affection for her. And I shared with her mother that Rembrandt had painted this image because he too had lost multiple children and his spouse. You can only paint a painting like this, said Vincent van Gogh about this image, when you've died many deaths. And I hope that was a comfort to Ramey's mother and I hope it's a comfort for you. We may have ambitions and plans to get married, to have kids, career, do stuff for the kingdom, and that's all okay. But some of our ambitions are as doomed as that plane that Ramey was on. And the only ambitions that are worth anything anyway are the ones that come from resting in God's ambition for us. When Jesus says in Matthew 6, tomorrow will be anxious for itself, he's trying to save us from the hell of the morrow in which we needlessly roast but God can't give grace for tomorrow, that's why it feels like hell. His grace is like manna, there's just enough for now. I think the best thing that you and I can do for broader church unity is to learn, like the beloved disciple, 
to rest in his arms ourselves. The gospel of God's grace is not first Protestant or Pentecostal or Catholic or Orthodox. (laughs) It's Pauline. It's Johannine. It's even before Paul and John. It pre-exists all of us. Before the foundation of the world, as John puts it, that is the glory that John was referring to, his unmerited favor. Remember the prologue, glory as the only son of the father, full of (laughs) grace and truth. His glory is grace. As I've said, we evangelicals don't own it, Still, without the Reformation recovery of grace, which inspired the Protestant painter Rembrandt, I wonder if it would have affected the Catholic priest Henry Nouwen. And without it affecting him, I wonder if it could have so affected the evangelical college student that God took home early. And when we see that kind of miracle, the exchange of gifts across what were once enemy lines, my guess is that it is the work of the one spirit stitching Christ's divided body back together. And maybe it's even possible to see the different figures in the painting as the great Christian traditions. Protestant, Catholic, Pentecostal, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox. We've each been the elder brother, consumed with the righteousness of our own traditions. We've each at times strangely assumed that this was a single child family. But the truth is, all the traditions are prodigal. We have all blown our inheritance. And if we don't know that, the world does. And just as Nouwen was totally unable to root out his own resentments, church history shows that we, the divided Christian churches, are totally unable to root out our own resentments as well. But grace can save us Because Jesus, our high priest, is not done praying for our unity. Now, his prayer was rudely interrupted by his arrest and murder, but he has been raised. (laughs) And his prayer for our unity continues even now, the prayer that we would be reconciled underneath the hands of his and our Father, to whom he pleaded that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me.